Yeah, Garfield stands for Global Anticoagulant Registry in the field. And then if you remember this, you know everything about Garfield. Simply means that this is a registry which is run worldwide in up to 35 countries, more than 800 centers covering all five or six continents. And it depends on how many continents you believe we have got on this earth. So we are considering all many, many countries, many different ethnic groups, many different regions, and the patients are included in the registry in all kind of care settings. GPs, hospitals, cardiologists, practicing cardiologists, anticoagulation clinics, neurology, emergency department, etc., etc. In other words, we tend to have the widest possible, uh, let's say, bunch of patients to be included in, in this registry uh, for several reasons to assess how patients are treated with atrial fibrillation and a specific uh, pattern of atrial fibrillation newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation worldwide. We want to know how they are treated, what is the impact of the treatment, what is the impact of the absence of treatment because they are not all treated with what is now recommended to avoid the stroke, systemic embolism, anticoagulation. So this is what we want to know from, uh, from Garfield. And uh, we plan to incorporate up to 55,000 patients, again worldwide and all care settings in five different cohorts and see over time what the uptake of the new therapies will be and what impact of the new therapies will be on, on, the, on the outcome of the patient. This is basically the, uh, the aims of Garfield Registry. Two-year outcome. Well, that's a very important question. So we have got now uh, up to 17,000 patients, 17,162 to be accurate, patients with two-year follow-up. Then we have assessed the outcome of this patient. And in the near future, we'll have many more patients with one-year outcome, two-year outcome. And then we will be in a position to compare the outcomes depending on how the patients are treated. Two-year outcome reveals something, some striking facts. We were interested in major adverse cardiac events, namely death and cause and type of death, mainly stroke systemic embolism, and the consequence, the side effect of uh, anticoagulation, bleeding. And, uh, what the, the surprise, not the surprise, but the most striking fact is that the most frequent adverse event at two years is not systemic embolism or stroke, is not bleeding, is death. The most frequent event is death. And it occurs at the rate of 3.8 per 100 patients a year. Three times as frequent compared to stroke system semi-combolism and even more comparing to bleeding. So death is definitely the most frequent event in this kind of population. And we tend to think that, well, what matters is stroke because the known complication of atrial fibrillation, but actually it is a complication, but death is much more frequent. Now, what is striking again is that the cause of death is equally, not exactly equally, but more or less equally distributed between non-cardiovascular deaths and cardiovascular deaths. And the most frequent causes of cardiovascular deaths are heart failure and sudden unwitnessed death. For non-cardiovascular deaths, this is malignancy and pulmonary disease. It simply means that we may have a little impact in the future on the risk of death because the most, the, the most frequent causes of death are not influenced by anticoagulation. This is the first point. As regards the variables that are 
let's say, associated with the risk of death, then we have got also striking results. And some were, let's say, not, we would have expected that they would be associated with a higher risk of death, namely age. The older you are, the higher the risk of death. Not a big surprise. But there are other variables that were not fully anticipated. And particularly, smoking. Smoking has never been described in natural fibrillation as a marker for death. It makes sense. Ex-smokers and current smokers have a higher risk of death. Chronic kidney disease has a major impact on the risk of death. It's known from other cardiovascular settings, but it's major impact in, actually in, uh, in Garfield. And you were asking questions about ethnicity. Asians have a lower risk of death than Caucasians. This is only for the risk of death. And then we have also information on the variables that are associated with the risk of uh, bleeding and also stroke systemic embolism. And for stroke systemic embolism, surprise, surprise, the same variables are the most tightly associated with the risk of stroke systemic embolism, namely, again, age. Surprisingly, chronic kidney disease, and not surprisingly, previous stroke or systemic embolism. This is a gross picture. As regards bleeding, again, age, Chronic kidney disease are the most potent factor associated with the, the risk of bleeding. But now the good news. The good news is that anticoagulation, because we have to understand that the population included in the first two cohorts of Garfield, totaling against, again 17,000 plus patients, it's a mixed population. With patients with anticoagulation, 60% of the cohort, and patients not anticoagulated, 40% of, of the cohort. And the impact of anticoagulation in this mixed population is enormous, with a 38% less risk, risk reduction for death with anticoagulant, and basically the same magnitude of reduction of stroke systemic embolism. So you have got now the full picture. So we know now what, what the major adverse events are in Garfield, and again, death is the most frequent. We know which variables are most strongly associated with the risk of death, and we know that anticoagulation is a major impact on both death and stroke systemic embolism. Of course, there is a price to pay, which is an increased risk of bleeding with anticoagulation. Yeah, the regional differences are quite evident. And um, we have had a specific analysis of not only 17,000 patients of the first two cohorts, but on the first three cohorts, totaling 28,000 patients. And what is uh, fascinating is that over time, we have observed that there is a gradual uptake in anticoagulation in Garfield. For the first two cohorts, the rate of anticoagulation was 60% only, and 10% only of the patients did receive the new oral anticoagulant. And the pattern has changed completely over time. In the third cohort, the rate of, uh, in other words, the uh, next 10,000 patients, I may say so, the rate of anticoagulation has increased to 70% of uh, patients, and the rate of prescription of new oral anticoagulant reaches 37%. So it's enormous, enormous increase. And, but it's not surprising, see what is called the registry effect. If you start a registry, then the investigators do their job as usual. But they commonly observe that over time, they, there is a greater uptake of guidelines recommended therapy. And it's exactly what happened. And what is interesting is that in all regions of the world, there was an uptake. All regions, all regions basically reached 70% of anticoagulation, anticoagulated patients. And the uptake of NOACs 
is everywhere except in Asia. For any reason, they have also an increase in the uptake of anticoagulation, but not NOAX, probably for economical reasons. As regards outcome, uh, we compared the outcome in Asia compared to the rest of other countries. And what is exciting is to discover that the Asians have a lower mortality rate. I will say that already, but much lower mortality rate even after adjustment. We do not understand the reason why. The common sense tells us that it's possibly linked to the fact that they are, the mean age is much lower in Asia than in other countries, but it's adjusted. There is something else. And we need further investigation to try to discover why there is such a low, lower rate of deaths at, uh, after a certain follow-up in Asian countries compared to uh, non-Asian countries.